Now, I was talking about this study of this um, review. It's a scoping review that I did with my friend, uh, Musa Watila in Nigeria and Marquis, a Canadian. And we look at the health service provision for people with epilepsy in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. It was a spoke, um, and the interest of this review was to see what is being done. And I, I hope that I have not made it a doom and gloom presentation when talking about the burden of epilepsy. And this is where I want to perhaps end with, 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 with um, a food for thought, the rest of us, about what we can do based on what has worked elsewhere. Now, in this scoping review, we found um, uh, that many studies have been carried out in, uh, or many interventions have been carried out to provide healthcare for people with epilepsy in, in our continent. And these are, have usually been rural based. And it's obvious because that is where the patients are. And the majority of these epilepsy uh, clinics or treatment centers, if you can call them that way, were led by nurses uh, or general health workers. So they are non-physician led clinics. Now, and what is the outcome that is found in this clinic? That there's usually good seizure control in about two thirds of patients in these programs, there's a good search, uh, uh, um, seizure control. Now, the next point, you may consider it as something positive or negative, but, the fact, but it is a fact that most of the funding came from external agencies. And we know what happens when the funding dries out. You know, the people are left to their own you know, uh, fortunes. Now, uh, some of these studies were done in uh, 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 Cameroon. Uh, a few epilepsy surgery in Africa is very, is, has not been explored. But as far as I'm concerned, we can't be talking about epilepsy surgery when we have not even treated the 70% that can be well controlled. So I have a bias not that I'm against epilepsy surgery, but I, I think that there is still way more to be done to get people uh, you know, to be treated medically. And what are the advantages of this nurse-led model in, in a rural setting is that most patients uh, are there. There's no need for specialists. There's no need for an EEG or even imaging. And I often tell my, uh, my students that or any any time I have the opportunity to talk to health workers about epilepsy, is that you can sit in one corner and say, "Oh, I can't do anything about epilepsy because I don't have access to EEG or imaging and what have you." You don't need it, or you can't. Your excuse for not treating epilepsy cannot be that you are not a physician or that you are not a neurologist. As I said earlier in my presentation, you can see that a lot of the concepts are simple and easy to grasp, and. The, the, this rural nurse-led model actually brings care close to the population and reduces the cost of treatment. And the drugs that are mostly used are phenobarbital. Now, the problem of sustainability, I, I, I evoked it when, uh, when you talk about, when you see where most of the funding came from. And how can we make this sustainable is by integrating this in our primary healthcare system. Now, if we look at the onchocerciasis and epilepsy, there's more and more advocacy for the onchocerciasis eradicate, the river blindness program to be incorporated with an epilepsy treatment program, wherein, for example, the trained um, community uh, distributors of ivermectin can also be uh, uh, trained on identification and distribution of anti-seizure uh, medications. And another aspect that makes sustainability really feasible is the fact that you only need to treat to train non-physician workers. There's no huge resource that is needed. And I can tell you that uh, it doesn't take much to train a non-physician health worker to treat epilepsy, but the results are staggering. Now, um, this slide just shows you a bit what I was talking about. So let's picture it this way. At the center of epilepsy care and reducing the treatment gap is having a, a nurse-led health area epilepsy clinic, for example, which diagnoses and treats people with epilepsy and offers counseling. And it can be linked to the district health service, which has the infrastructure and the personnel 
for a, a clinic at the level of the district hospital ensures uh, the availability of anti-seizure medications. And there, there is a need for advocacy for the government to subsidize anti-seizure medications the same way it subsidizes other, other uh, drugs for other conditions. And, and honestly, the data is there. The, no, no one can say they don't know that epilepsy is a problem. There really needs to be some arm twisting in terms of advocacy to get the, 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 the government and the drug fund to prioritize and subsidize, prioritize epilepsy and subsidize anti-seizure medications. Um, you can have mobile clinics in hard to reach communities where you know, people and people with epilepsy can you know, benefit from home visits to monitor their ad adherence. And um, you can have at the level of the district hospital a, 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 an epilepsy team. And I would say here yeah, that while uh, I worked in Batibo, I actually started and ran an epilepsy clinic where I saw about 100, uh, or, uh, where I had 100 people registered and receiving anti-seizure medications uh, monthly. And at the time, before I, I left, and unfortunately with the war, everything is lost, the seizure control, about uh, 60 of my patients were seizure-free and only on phenobarbital. And uh, the, what are the potential partners for such a, an initiative you have? Of course, your guess is as good as mine. I will just put up a few things there. It is not exhaustive. You have, you know, the Ministry of Health. Now the government talks more and more about, you know, decentralization of resources and, and all that. I think that we, we need to have a drive to look for partners that can, you know, uh, fund uh, whether it is, you know, uh, research on the risk factors or interventions to, prevent the conditions that lead to epilepsy or just looking after the welfare of people with epilepsy. And I end by suggesting my uh, few thoughts about how we can redress the burden of epilepsy in Cameroon. We need more cohort and risk factor studies to be really, you know, uh, we need more cohort studies to understand some of the risk factors that are not well understood, especially uh, cystic psychosis and onchocerciasis. Uh, I, I, I think we are not going to address epilepsy unless we take care of parasitic infections and infestations. Prevention of these parasites is probably our best bet at controlling or at least getting epilepsy to a point that it's not as big a problem as it is now. Training of personnel and health personnel is essential. And I'll refer anyone to the International League Against Epilepsy. They have numerous resources that are available free for people who would want to you know, get more knowledge on, on epilepsy. And I'm available to share some of the, the, the resources. We need to constantly engage with other stakeholders. I haven't talked much about them, traditional healers, teachers, and clerics. And say what you want. These are the people that are, they are more listened to by the community than the white coat physician. So until we have a, a, an uncondescending um, you know, conversation with these other stakeholders, uh, we would, if we don't come up down from our high horse sometimes, we are not going to be able to grasp the problem. I remember a study that we did with traditional healers in, in Batibo, and the understanding I got from, from you know, interacting with them is that you know, many times uh, when you approach a traditional healer, the first thing is they are very confrontational. But once they see that you're coming to them with, from, you know, you're, you're not there to, to steal some of their patents, if you're just there to have a conversation. I mean, once you break, that initial um, you know, barrier, there's quite a lot that can be achieved. Those who of us who are involved in disease control and vaccination know what I'm talking about. And finally, I can't emphasize enough on the importance of us you know, thinking about having nurse-led, or I should say non-physician-led rural epilepsy clinics in areas that are endemic. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. 
Thank you so much for this um, exciting presentation, Dr. Anguafo. And I don't know, you were worried and asking yourself if you were going to deliver. Oh, you outshone you. You just outdid yourself. This was impressive. Thanks for, for enlightening us. Before we begin the uh, question and answer session, there are a few uh, people in the house whom I would like to acknowledge and whose thoughts uh, I would like to hear um, right away. Dr. Alain Lekobo. Hi, Doc. You hear me? Sorry. Uh, I, I'm actually multitasking. Sorry. But I was listening very carefully. And, and really, Dr. Anguafo, this is an excellent presentation. And I'm not sure how, I mean, when we last met, probably like two decades or now, maybe one, one and a half decades now. And, and I was impressed by what you did, what you've done so far. And despite uh, working in a very, quote unquote, hostile environment, and, and 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 you are one of the example of that of people. Uh, I mean, one of the example that we can do a lot with little, and uh, and your 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 consistency is really uh, something to praise. And and I, I sometimes feel like we should have been working together. And I think when I sit together, I don't. Do, I don't it's not me. It's just like as a team of people who can provide uh, the expertise in epilepsy. To try and see how we can work together, right, and and, and get things moved. And and um, one of the things that you said and which really uh, uh, struck me was the fact that in Cameroon, it seems like epilepsy is a disease of uh, the environment, basically. So if we take care of our environment, we take care of most cases of epilepsy, or, or I mean, a, a it turned to be a big number of cases of epilepsy. That's that's what it's, it started to be when I listened to you, and you brought. I mean, you provided a lot of of of, uh, of data to support that, and which was very impressive. I look at the map that you showed, and and that really uh, uh, taught us that we could do a lot to prevent epilepsy if we could take care of our environment. Okay. Having said that, it seems to be easy, all right? But in practice, it's extremely difficult. You have to take into, into account for the political situation in Cameroon and the economic situation as well. And even the willingness of, the willingness of, the willingness of people to agree that epilepsy uh, comes from the environment. So we take care of environment, we might take care of a good number of patients with epilepsy. But my, my, one of the things that, 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 that uh, popped in my mind when, when you were talking was uh, that idea of, of uh, epidemiological transition. So I was wondering if we are still at the stage where infectious diseases are the bulk of cause of epilepsy in Cameroon. When we look at what's happening, uh, we have, I mean, malaria is still there, HIV is still there, tuberculosis is still there, but we are having a huge number of patients having diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, upper epidemia, and then they're having stroke. At the same time, when you look at our urbanization, 20 years ago, we had no motorcycle or very few motorcycles in our cities. Now you have a lot of those, uh, they call it benzikin, and you just can't see, you, you just, I mean, look, looking, looking at what's happening, I don't have the, the figures. It seems like we have a lot of uh, motorcycle accident and a lot of car accident and a lot of TBI resulting, I mean, too much brain injury from those car accidents. So it seems like we are going through a transition from those, uh, from epilepsy being an infectious disease towards being an acquired disease from uh, things like TBI, things like uh, stroke. I don't want to mention cancer and other other quite cause of, 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 of epilepsy. So my my concern is that we might be lagging behind in trying to catch up with this transition happening and just focusing on epilepsy on on, on, on uh, infectious causes, which are important. I don't I don't disagree, but that would happen. I, I would love to see a shift in a paradigm where we now try and. Spend, spend more time on the other cause of epilepsy. Now you can prevent that. Um, I, I'm not sure what 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 what's your experience on the on the field. Did. And and again, this was this was. I mean, I was amazed, impressed by what you did. And and, and kudos, kudos. Thanks for those great insights, Doctor Nakubo. And now that now we now that we have your attention, Doc, mm -hmm. are we seeing potential for partnership with? Um, uh, Dr. Anguafo and the great colleagues who are doing work back home, are we seeing active potential for partnership in the near weeks, in the next coming weeks or months? Well, Dr. Anguafo is on the field. I think if there's anything to be done, if there's any start point, I don't want, and it's going to be 
from those who are seeing patients and who know what their needs and what type of partnership they can decide. And, and the mistake that we always, I mean, that we sometimes make, uh, I'm thinking about those who are working or practicing abroad, is that we think we are, we are on our horse and believe that we can come and make a drastic change uh, in, 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 the, in the field. That's a huge mistake. In my opinion, we should, I mean, be open to, I mean, first come and listen to uh, those people working with and phenomenal work on the field. And they are the one that say, okay, we are here. And they are the one to say, okay, uh, this is how we can, we can work together. This is what you can do to try and help us move. We will never, I mean, love, love, believe me, uh, those guys, those guys who are abroad, they, they will brag about being abroad and everything they want to have the country, but they will never leave what they, they, are, they, they will never leave their comfort. Let's, 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 be, let's be honest and go to, uh, whatever uh, Asia, Cameroon, or, or, or Latin America, to establish themselves and work there, or even spend their time doing that. Except, except there is willingness from partners on the field to work together. We've seen how Dr. Aguafo had worked with partners in Canada, in, in in Great Britain, and he's doing that because he he knows what he needs from those people. Ultimately, he's the one to say, okay, this is what. I need, this is how I uh, will lead the field of epilepsy in Cameroon. And people should let Dr. Nguafo do his work. I mean, personally, I, I wouldn't spend so many years working on something and to see someone coming from elsewhere and say, okay, I am the boss, I'm going to do it for you. I would never, I mean, let's be honest. I've seen people, I've seen, I've seen uh, uh, EEG technologies in the US, in other countries, go to Cameroon and want to establish an EEG clinic. What does that mean? What's the impact of doing so? Nothing, nothing. So you have to build, I mean, just like in the Bible, right? Yes, there's, there's a stone and there's a foundation. You, you, you come and add a stone to that foundation and see how you can help. It could be a little stone, but it could be a, a, a cornerstone, right? No, That's thank you, Doga. Thank you so much. No, I, 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 your points are really valid. I guess maybe my question didn't come out right. I was talking more around encouraging, um, collaborations, whether we're looking at North-South collaborations or South-South collaborations. And yes, I agree with you that there's this whole concept of decolonizing the way collaborations are being done. Traditionally, experts in the global North feel like, you know, they know it all and they come and they tell people what they do. But we see potential here in terms of research collaborations. Maybe if we have uh, uh, colleagues out here like yourself who are doing work that's in a similar field, potential to collaborate around research funding, grant applications, just so we can have our colleagues who are actually doing the work have more resources in terms of, well, not just funding, but even like material technology that would, they would need to make their work easier. Because I can't commend Dr. Anguafo's work even, like he's yeah. just amazing. Looking it's at amazing. the research output he's bringing up from his with his team, despite the challenges on the ground. So Dr. Anguafo, I think this is an opportunity for you maybe to highlight some of the priority areas that you feel like, okay, if we had to do work, in, in, in epilepsy, what would be the priority areas? And if there's someone who is looking to partner with you uh, in making this happen or looking to support your work, how best would the, should the person go about it? May I say I something quickly asked. before you? Okay. Yes, yes, I think yes, one important thing, I don't want to like restate the thunder to Dr. Uh, from Dr. Nguafo. We have to align our goals. I mean, try to find a common ground somewhere. That's one thing. The other thing is that I would say is that there is money available in some uh, institutions here for developing countries. You just have to prove that people can trust you. I've seen that happening uh, in the field of stroke in Nigeria, for example. Why can't we do this? I and mean, then this is happening because there are Nigerian people back home in Nigeria and some in the US here. They used to forget the grants. There are so many grants around. They were able to bring money back to them, and they did that without. I mean, just out of like being, 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 being I mean, being, 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 feeling that they need to do something for that for their country. The guys here, they, 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 I mean, they got nothing. Just like they wanted to do something for their country. So what I'm saying is that there are opportunities for bringing money to Cameroon. The money is here. That's all. Let's just be honest. You have to find a way to get into, man, to connect to, the, to the, that that pipeline of money. That and, and they, those, those those ways exist. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. 
Um, Dr. Nguafo, I don't know, maybe before we open up to other people, what do you think would be the key priority areas maybe for research and for support in terms of moving the work uh, in epilepsy that you and your team are already doing the amazing work, what do you think would be the key priority areas moving it forward? Uh, thank you, Alison. And uh, uh, this is the question I never hoped for. You, you realize how, what, how huge, what a task I have horses. And it's like asking a mother, a parent who their favorite baby is. <laughs> yes, uh, you, and you can see we have uh, many um, knowledge gaps, whether you're looking at research, whether you're just looking at the epidemiology. I mean, the studies that I've shown, you, you see that there's a recurrent theme. They're mostly from the same areas, right? We don't yet have a, 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 a global a picture of what epilepsy uh, country what looks like. So uh, I think we, we first of all need to really, you know, uh, study epilepsy a little in a bit more detail, looking at where the the areas that are most affected. Because I think one of what one of the things that this can do and has a knock on effect is, if if we have a, a map of the epilepsy situation uh, at least, uh, uh, if not in the whole country in the regions that are most affected, that can give us an idea where resources should be allocated. Because I mean, it, it, we, we cannot possibly, you know, have the same resources for epilepsy in, let's say, the north. And I'm not saying this because there's any data supporting the fact that there's less epilepsy in the north. I just haven't come across much literature in that area compared to some of these communities where we have up to, you know, I mean, in, in Batibo, where I've worked a lot, and most of Momo Division, I've worked right up uh, to Ngi, Ngi Village, which is neighboring. You have uh, families where, uh, places where a whole family, every single person has epilepsy. So if we can, you know, have a map of where this epilepsy is most common, I think that can be a starter. Now, prevention is good and is laudable, but we, we have to also prevent in the areas that are most affected. So I guess studies of, you know, just looking at the burden and the prevalence of epilepsy are, are, are sort of a priority. Now, the treatment, uh, people who have epilepsy now will ask the question, now, are, are we going to wait for epilepsy to be marked in the whole country before we have access to, main, to basic medication? And I think that's another area where there is an emergency. We need anti-seizure medication. And um, my friend, uh, Dr. Fondo, who, run, who is uh, in charge of the Northwest um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for Health, and, and for those of us who are not familiar, this is the agency that's responsible for acquiring most of the drugs that are distributed to the, to the, uh, to the health centers and most health facilities in the region. Uh, I've, I'm just baffled at why the price of uh, phenobarbital was increased tenfold. And it, 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 it just beats, you know, before when I would do this presentation, I would boast about the fact that you can treat epilepsy, a year's treatment of epilepsy could cost less than a dollar. I have quite, uh, you know, I've taken out that slide from my presentation for the past two years now, because it's no longer the case. So why can't we just go back to the situation where um, anti-seizure medications are just so subsidized to the point where the people who are most in need have it? So how can we achieve that? That will involve a lot of you know, advocacy with the government, because if anybody comes in with money to subsidize treatment, it's not going to, if it's not sustainable, I mean, it is not going, going to work. If I, there are times when I get donations of levetiracetam, for example, and they expire in my cupboard. How do you start somebody on levetiracetam and they get seizure free within three months? And then you turn around and tell them that, oh, that drug, that medication is finished. What do you do? You know, so we, we need to focus on phenobarbital. I would say phenobarbital is what we need to focus on. How can we get 
phenobarbital available. And if we have, I'm, I am ashamed to say this, but it is the truth, valproate and carbamazepine are a luxury. Many people can't afford it, but at least uh, raising, you know, making sure that phenobarbital is available is, is, is certainly uh, important. I, I don't know. I, my, I think my long and winding answer uh, uh, mirrors the complexity of your question. No, I agree with you, Doc. And truly, it's 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 a hard one. We see a Matthias Forby in the house. I don't know if it's Professor Forby who is with us this morning. Hi, Matthias Forby. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hi, hi, Prof. We are excited to have you join us this morning or afternoon where you are. How are you doing? Fine, fine. I'm very impressed with the lecture and I am fascinated by the presenter. So go ahead. <laughs> yes, Prof. We just wanted to, you know, acknowledge your presence with us here in the house and to check with you if you have any thoughts regarding um, Dr. Anya's presentation and potentially the way forward. Um, I think he's doing a fantastic job. And like one of the previous speakers said, those of us in the diaspora turn to him and help him do what he needs to do. I don't think we can go there to tell him what has to be done. He has to turn around, he's the expert and let us know. I personally joined today because I was informed that Dr. Uh, uh, a sponsor, our moderator, Dr. Foma, a past member of the Cameroon Physicians Abroad. We're trying to look how we, the Cameroon doctors in America, can collaborate with him in this forum. And so I wanted to see how the forum was run and how we can collaborate to help the engineers we have acquired overseas back to our home. And what I've seen so far sounds very impressive. And I hope we can work from there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Forby. This is this is exciting news for the town hall. Um, it shows that you know our work has probably been having an impact and that our leadership from the top, Dr. Forma, has been doing a great job at keeping things going. And Dr. Uh, Professor Forby, we are excited to have you. If you have any feedback for us uh, in terms of how we could do things better, please, we are very open to receiving it and do not hesitate to reach out. And uh, Dr. Anguafo, now that we have Professor Forby in the house and a lot of our senior colleagues who have your attention, I think this is a time for us to use this opportunity to lobby and push the agenda ahead when it comes to epilepsy in Cameroon. If we need those epidemiological studies, now is the time to push the agenda forward because it's about time we have things documented. Meanwhile, we are going to open the floor uh, for questions and answers. Please, if you have a question, kindly use the raise hand function on Zoom and we will call you to ask your question. Alternatively, you can drop your question in the chat and we are going to read it out for you. So Brian and I will keep an eye on the chat and on the raise hand functions on Zoom. Brian, how are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. It's a, it's a really, really deep and, and great honor to, to have uh, Professor Forby um, in, uh, join us in the town hall. And he's been a huge, huge uh, inspiration. I remember when I was going through medical school, learned a lot about um, his work. He was the creator of what we call the Forby part and one of the most renowned um, obesity surgeons in the world, and uh, he's done a lot to, to improve uh, obesity care uh, in the United States and, and just been a great, great uh, inspiration to other younger physicians and, and, and other uh, people uh, behind us. So it's really, really, a, a really deep and deep honor for us to have uh, Professor Forby uh, join us today and just wanted to acknowledge uh, his presence. Um, thanks, uh, Alison. Thank you, Brian. I, I don't know if there are any gynecologists, obstetricians in the house. And the reason I'm asking this is because Dr. Anguafo has enlightened us and opened our eyes to the fact that 
what we would usually think of epilepsy as just being, you know, the seizures, there's a lot more that is involved. We have issues with fertility um, in, among patients who are living with epilepsy, and this affects them not only in, you know, being able to conceive a child, but maybe even sustaining a pregnancy to, you know, to term and give birth in our settings. And if there's anybody who's had, had experience in managing epilepsy in pregnancy, personally as a woman, that's something I would be interested in knowing more about. But Dr. Anguafo, what has been your experience with managing epilepsy among pregnant women? Uh, th thank you. Uh, I think my answer here is going to be brief. And that's because it's very little. <laughs> I, I have a, a little, and, and, and I think this reflects the, the bias that we have. Not so, once, so as a neurologist, I, when I see patients and I'm looking after their seizures, uh, I'm, I'm focused on their seizures. It's true that I pay attention to other things, especially on the psychological side. Um, and, and, and this is, uh, uh, thank you, Alison, for bringing this up because it, it, it never really gets highlighted enough. The, 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 the problems that women have to encounter because of their, their epilepsy is just, it's, 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 it, I mean, what men suffer pales in comparison that women have to go through. Uh, they're pregnant, they, they have to, now one very effective, medication that you know is widely used and has a very you know good efficacy which is biproid is all of a sudden there are red flags everywhere uh, a woman who's well controlled who has a pregnancy now may not know what to do whether to uh, stop their medications to do it and then we've talked about the fertility uh, issues and then when it comes to delivery what happens how does the hormone uh, how do you know, it is it is huge and complex, and um, I, I would admit that this is the part of uh, you, you. You probably noticed from my presentation that I didn't talk much about it because my recent my experience there is very little, and I, this is an eye opener for me to, you know, not me. And I'm sorry if in some of my presentation I gave the impression that I have been doing. A lot. I, I have a wonderful, uh, you know, people that I work with. Uh, talking of Professor Alfred Jam, she was uh, like a pioneer when it comes to neurology and epilepsy in in Cameroon and Africa. He's an authority. He's mentored me and he's been the one who has opened doors for me. And you have um, my other colleagues. I see Dr. Fonsa uh, in the town hall. Dr. Forma himself, I suspect if he were not in the US, he would be some uh, advocate for <laughs> epilepsy care in Cameroon at the moment. So I thought I should just acknowledge uh, that and that there are a lot of people that are involved. Now back to, to, to this, um, I, I think that there is a place to work with gynecologists and pediatricians to look at this aspect that is understudied. Um, you see that a lot of the work is, more, is epidemiology and public health and clinical research has really not been explored a lot and especially in the domain of women. Those are great responses. I see uh, Brian San is up. Brian, please. I, 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 my question was more uh, specific to, uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Lekubo if the same uh, pattern of onchocerciasis and cystic psychosis that um, um, the, Dr. Anguafo mentioned, he's, uh, he, he's been observing in his studies in Cameroon, if he's seeing that same pattern in the US, or what are the main uh, triggers for epilepsy among your um, neurology consults in, in the US? Do you find more poor income or low income uh, people presenting with epilepsy and what's typically the driver for that um, in this in this uh, sector? Okay, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure the what what we see in the US here is probably different from what we see in Cameroon, and and, and you can imagine that uh, uh, that what I want to call that epidemiological transition has already happened here. Um, when I, I mean, I see patients with epilepsy. That's that's what I do every 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 day. 
and my priority adult epilepsy. But when you look at epilepsy distribution, it's bimodal. You have the epilepsy before the age of one, then the highest priority for the age of one, and after 60, 65 year old. So in between, you have a mix of everything. So after 65 year old, it's mostly dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease in particular, and stroke, neoplasm, and uh, for the most part, and also TBR survivors. Before one year old, it's mostly quote unquote genetic epilepsy. And in between, you have a mix of genetic and also acquired cause of epilepsy. And uh, in the in males between 40 and 50 year olds, TBR plays a major, major role, and stroke as well, as we have recently shown in the, in the, in the paper that we published um, in, uh, in neurology. So it's a mix of everything that we see in this plasma. Onchocerciasis or infectious diseases play probably a, a minor role. As a matter of fact, when we, the US, the US, the US MLE, uh, when there, there was a very famous question about uh, this patient from coming from India and having epilepsy. And when you see that, you know the answer is going to be onchocerciasis, all right? So the myth here is that those who have epilepsy from onchocerciasis or other uh, parasitic infection, they come from developing countries, which is somehow true, right? So that to answer your question, it's a different uh, uh, pattern in terms of its eti 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 etiology. Um, I, I, you said, I mean, you had the second question, right? I didn't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I quite remember the second question, uh, or the second part of your question. What was that again? I, uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Lekubo. I, I think you answered it. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, as a Tanguapa, I think that's your, I mean, you have some experience, right, from talking to people, right? In, uh, I did, can you come again, Dr. Lekuku? No, I'm just asking if you had the same experience while talking to other people around, um, as far as the difference in etiology between uh, what we call northern countries and then southern countries. I, I, so, I, southern I I, countries. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with, with your assessment. And I think for some of the, you know, the etiologies that you, we, we find, yeah, if you were, in, um, in Europe or in the US, you would have to find them in travel clinics or in, uh, in centers that treat people from um, uh, hyper endemic areas or in the inner cities where you have uh, people from low income countries who travel regularly. I mean, cases of neurocysticercosis, trigline epilepsy, uh, you know, are there, but they're mostly limited to case reports in, 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 in high, they're mostly, uh, uh, you know, people who have traveled. And the, the cliche that uh, 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 Dr. Lekubo uh, makes reference to is quite eloquent. I mean, once you say somebody has traveled to India or to Brazil <laughs> or to any part of Africa and came back and had a seizure, if you don't think about neurosis to psychosis, you're... <laughs> You know, but now in, in, in Cameroon, I think that kind of bimodal distribution is, is, is there, but less, less obvious. Now, we are also, um, I'm happy with Dr. Lekubo's emphasis on this demographic transition, because one of the transitions is also that we are having an, at our aging population, we are living longer, believe you me. Despite all the gunshots and the COVID and the everything, we are living longer. And so we have also seen more elderly people. I'm having many people who come in clinic with, with seizures that started at 50 years, 60 years. Um, a, a third of my patients uh, follow with cognitive impairment or dementia have, have seizures. And um, uh, in the very young, that it's unfortunate. Uh, most of them have the, you know, the genetic epilepsies that are very you know, difficult to treat. And a neuropediatrician is in a better place but in the middle, in the middle, that is where there is hope. One, because here it is populated by mostly uh, either people who have what we refer to as the idiopathic epilepsies, which are usually have a very good outcome, or the preventable epilepsies, which would be due to onchocerciasis and, you know, and uh, neurocystic psychosis. So what I mean is, um, I think in, in Cameroon, I would say it's most is is you would find more than bimodal. It's if the word is allowed, it's trimodal, and the ones in the middle are those that we can actually uh, treat and prevent. Thank you for that response, Doc. And uh, you, it's like you just read my mind because I was looking at Dr. Balantangua, 
who is a geriatrician in the UK. And we know that another group of people where we do have a lot of um, neurological conditions and epilepsy could be uh, quite common among that population. Dr. Valentine Gua, hi. Hi, hi uh, nice to be here. <laughs> so maybe what has your experience been like among your patients in uh, the older uh, patients that you see in the UK when it comes to epilepsy? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, Dr. Lekubu did touch on that as well. Um, we, we are getting quite a lot of people coming down with epilepsy in the, the later years because of uh, stroke disease, uh, cardiac metabolic syndromes, and of course, uh, dementia, cognitive impairments. And um, they, they, that's where it gets quite tricky because quite a few of the medications that, um, first of all, Dr. Gwafo, thanks so much for your, for your input. I, do, I did enjoy your, your talk, thanks so much. Uh, quite of the few medications now you didn't mention has got very little evidence in the elderly population. And, and over here in the UK, when I'm based, I'm a physician in the UK, we use more of either lamotrigine, levetiracetam, or phenytoin, which we think got some evidence in the older population. And the country like Spain, because we know about 30% of stroke patients will come down with post-stroke epilepsy. In a country like Spain, their protocol used to be, and I don't know if it's still the same, uh, it used to be anybody after having a stroke will automatically go on an anti-epileptic medication for prevention. So that's a very big thing to, to do with them. Now, quite interestingly, and, and um, when I was listening to, there was one of the presentations from our neurosurgeons in Cameroon who did surgery on a child that had epilepsy and was able to remove, uh, I think it was a cystosecosis cyst or something like that. And that child had to come off um, anti-epileptic medications. My question, Dr. Nguafo, then is, considering that some of these things could be potentially curable, therefore stopping the child from being condemned to a lifetime of a medication that has significant consequences for behavioral problems and early cognitive impairment, is doing a CT scan or some sort of imaging part of your protocol in managing these patients, because you want to think that if you pick up a child with something that is surgically manageable and stop them having all these medications, which are not innocent medications, you could stop them from being condemned to a lifetime of medication side effects. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ngoa. Your, your, your question is uh, very, uh, um, uh, I enjoy your question. And I'll, I'll just say one thing. Now, my, I um, actually request more CT scans for headaches than I request for epilepsy. And the reason is because they really, and when you consider the, the, the socioeconomic situation, it adds very little value, even, even when you suspect that the patient has neurocystisecosis. Uh, and the truth is, before you know that neurocystisecosis is a cause of the epilepsy, the, it is, the cyst has actually calcified and the parasite is dead. So it is actually the, the irritation because of the scar that is the cause of the, 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 the seizures. So even antiparasitic treatment at that stage is, is useless. So um, perhaps if there is a place for epilepsy surgery if it touches you know, the temporal lobe, which is known to be very you know, where you have most of the uh, treatment resistant epilepsies. But if we're just looking at the big picture, uh, except you have a, a brain tumor or some other obvious cause, the uh, brain scan really doesn't add value when you're looking at your initial package investigating for epilepsy. Now, in my practice, what I do is um, I, I reduce the threshold when I'm dealing with a treatment resistant epilepsy or when I have a focal abnormality on the EEG. So, or if I see, if I encounter a patient who has a reason to think that there's a structural problem. And even then, if I don't think that it's a structural problem that is amenable to, to treatment, I, although I would recommend 
I don't usually push the patient overboard because the, the challenge we have with investigations here, and we all know uh, is when you send them to the lab or you send them for an investigation, the moment they come back with the investigation, they expect what? That everything is going to be solved. Now, how do you tell somebody to go and do an MRI that costs sometimes up to 300,000 that, oh, well, we found the malformation of cortical development. That's why you have seizures. And he says, what next? You say, okay, you continue on the medication that I was giving you previously. And the question is like, if you knew this, then why didn't you just keep me on my medications? And you look at the cost. So. I see your point. I see your point. So I, think, is... I, I think I think in, in a way, where I was driving at is those little, those little five or Sorry, Doctor. I was I was mute there. Uh, yeah. Sorry, where where I was driving at, and as, as there, I I certainly understand where you're coming from. I, I think in a way when we look at the statistics, it's a bit different. We're looking at individuals, uh, as clinicians, we're looking at individuals because if I have a relative, for example, who has come down with seizures, I will once can't doing. The reason I once can't doing is if he comes back and says there's a structural problem that is not amenable to surgery. And then that's fine. I'll condemn you to a lifetime of anti epileptic medication with attendant consequences. And don't forget, many of the people will be children, and you carry them through the life course with those medications. And my God, I work in Cameroon. And if you see people who have been on Fenibabitol for, for decades, you see them, you will know. The way they present themselves, you will just know that they've been on anti epileptic medication. So these are not just the innocent medication. That's where I was, I was, where I was coming from. Um, over my, our practice here in the UK, and I spent 40. 30% of my time doing what we term as acute medicine in the UK. So people from 18 to 65. And um, our practice here is there's a, there's, a, there's a neurology run clinic called the first seizure clinic. But those patients with the first seizure will not go to the neurologist. They'll come under the acute physicians. So we our job is to find out if there are any causes medically and then get a scan and refer them to the neurologist. Now, if they have a second seizure, then we start anti-epileptic medication before referring them to the neurologist. So we don't treat the first seizure, we send them to the second, we send them to the first seizure clinic, but they don't go there without a CT scan at least. And then the neurologist will take it and run it with it. But if they have a second seizure, then you start anti-epileptic medications and then you send them to the neurologist. But thanks so much for your talk. I really did enjoy it. And I'm thank you for the work you're doing back in Cameroon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valenza Ngua. Dr. Former, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Alison. Thank you. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Professor Forby for joining us. And uh, I'm still a member of the ACPA and uh, just have not attended their meetings. And I need to update my registration, which is a, it's an association that did help me when I moved to the US in order to transition. And uh, back home, so I'm asking this because Dr. Anguafo really made me very interested in epilepsy. I know he was working, Batibo is my mom's village, which I was interested in because I know a lot of people who had epilepsy or have family members who actually had seizures. And that was a question we talked about every time we went to Batibo in order to learn surgery. I was learning a lot of uh, primary care surgery from Dr. Anguafo back in the days. And we did talk about when I started my specialization back home, I think it was in uh, clinical pathology, we're talking about doing a research where we wanted to actually find out the prevalence of uh, neurocystisicosis in Batibo. And I had talked with late Professor Osomo Moyo about this, and the protocol was really to get serological testing, which we could get. There was a Japanese company that was doing it at the time, and, and uh, because we could not get CT scans in order to prove the presence of it. So there was a Japanese company that had developed a serology that could differentiate the brain infection from local infection, which we could actually know by just doing that. And my question is, after doing this and knowing, maybe let's get to know about this, what do you think we could do further? I know it's controversial about treatment. That's where I'm going to, it's controversial whether treatment is gonna work or not, but there is some recommendation from the American Infectious Disease Society to combine albendazole with praziquantel. 
nobody has the efficacy of how if it's going to work or not. Is that something you think we can do now that we share abendazole is cheap? We do share praziquantel to some areas in Cameroon for parasitic prevention. Is that an area where we could target and actually just treat them, even without knowing epidemiologically looking, coming from, let's say, a, a public health perspective? I know you did make a notion to the fact that even using antiparasitics don't work most of the time. But is that something that you think uh, can be a strategy in those areas? Uh, thank you, my brother. Now, uh, good luck with trying to convince a, I mean, as it is, uh, uh, you, you, you surely sense that from the look of things, epilepsy has taken the back seat when it comes to prioritizing you know, um, our priorities in our healthcare. But good luck with trying to uh, advocate for anyone to start distributing Prazicantel and Abendazole at the massive scale um, when we don't have an idea of what the population attributable fraction is, because that is essentially, you, if you went with that kind of uh, uh, pro uh, protocol, the question is how many uh, number of people with, I mean, how much of epilepsy would you be preventing? And we simply don't have that data. And I, 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 can, I, I, I agree with you that the serology studies that have been done are really quite, they're not well powered. And because uh, not much imaging has been done. And one of the limitations is cost, but another one is just scanning people's brains for the purpose of uh, 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 being a control in a study. You know, there are many ethical issues that come, <laughs> that come to play. Like, what do you do if you find a brain tumor or what, you know, uh, and all the other, you know, findings. So it is a bit more uh, complex. But what I can say is that most of parasitic infections that have been incriminated in, in epilepsy, and indeed in many other uh, conditions, are contracted through poor hygiene, poor food handling. So I would argue more, I would advocate more for, you know, better, you know, hygiene and sanitation services, better, you know, better uh, food inspection, for example, um, uh, you know, even having a more uh, elaborate way of uh, checking the, the slaughterhouses, whether they are, they are, you know, the animals are infected. You know, that may be more uh, efficacious. And why, why not vaccination, both humans and pigs? I think that is a more sustainable, it may be more expensive uh, and it may be more ephemeral, but I think it's also more achievable. Uh, if, you, if you had, uh, first, and, uh, first of all, Prazicantel and, and Albendazole, like I said, it only uh, deals with those who have the active cyst in their brain. The majority of people with neurosis, epilepsy due to neurosis and psychosis have the calcified cyst with a parasite there. So you're not treating their, one, you're not reducing seizure frequency. You're not treating their epilepsy. You're not treating their cyst psychosis. You are only have deworming people, not so. And if, as long as the hygiene and sanitation conditions do not improve, it's only going to be a matter of time before they become reinfected. Yeah, Doc. No, I, I agree with you that the oh, the interlap or over, overlap, sorry, between one health and um, epilepsy cannot truly be overemphasized, especially for um, Cameroon and a lot of our other sub-Saharan African settings. I see there's a hand up. I think that's going to be our last question for today. There's a hand up. Uh, someone joins with the Dr. name Dita. ICT. Oh, sorry. Dr. Dita, please. The floor is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Alison. Finally, I'm home. Uh, as you guys could tell when I was introducing Dr. Nguafo, I had a ban on my head because I was out playing some tennis early this morning. Now I am back home. Trust me, uh, I listened to the entire presentation and I'm sure the audience were not disappointed. It is great when we have a speaker, an expert on a topic, who can present his own work, his own work. He's not borrowing work from someone from somewhere else, work that he did in his own setting. 
So Dr. Ngwafo, I, I had no doubt about the person you were ever going to become. And today you just proved me once again that you have become exactly the person we wanted you to become. I wanted to make a comment on the last discussion that we've been having regarding management, imaging. I think the approach, because of where Dr. Angwafo is, is a kind of approach that public health experts will recommend. And it's primarily driven by the fact that the resources that he is that he has at his disposal or that these patients have at their disposal to do anything are very limited. And from a public health perspective, how can you make the greatest impact in the community? I'll tell you what, if you are a CT scan, I don't know whether the price has changed, the cost ranges anywhere from 75 to 100,000. How many Cameroonians, families that have an epileptic patient can pay that amount of money and still have even a dime to pay for medication? You know, I was fortunate that when I uh, finished medical school, I practiced in Cameroon. The realities are entirely different. There are parents that came in, you examine them, you order blood work, they go do the test. In fact, the, every single dime they had pays for the test. And when you write the medication, they don't have anything to pay with. How have you helped that patient? So, so the policy or the approach in managing epilepsy is probably driven more by the setting where you are what resources you have, and who your patients are. As he rightly pointed out, among the many epileptics, how many will really have something that will be picked up on imaging that you actually make a difference in resolving that problem? If it is only to get the diagnosis and then not be able to do anything, how have you helped that patient? So again, I just wanted to really thank uh, Dr. Angwafo for taking his time this evening. Uh, I know how busy he is uh, to come and talk to us on uh, epilepsy. And as we all know, he's a guy from Mancon. Mancon just lost uh, 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 our king. And we are going through, the, we just coordinated a new king. And everybody is still absorbing the kind of atmosphere and the culture that was demonstrated by the Mancon people. And he was still able to create time to come and talk to us. Doctor, thank you very much. Some of us sit in the diaspora, but you went back home to make a difference. Please continue the good work. You, you, we sincerely appreciate the work you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zita. And what a beautiful way for us to close out today's session. We began with Dr. Zita introducing Dr. Anguafo, and we're going to end with Dr. Zita, you know, uh, highlighting Dr. Angwafo's accolades and um, giving us some good vibes from the Mancon people and their palace. Um, before we close out for today's session, I'm going to call on our chairman himself, Dr. Foma, to give a vote of thanks to our presenter for today. Okay, so I want to always start by thanking everyone who is here today, everyone who makes time. As Alison will tell you, we all started this town hall together with all the moderators. Our, the goal was just to educate those back home in Cameroon after experiencing COVID in New York City. And uh, I thought it wise that I share my experience because then I just finished internal medicine and I was getting into oncology fellowship, but I was seeing patients as an internist. And I share my experience with the rest of Cameroonians because I thought this was going to be a big pandemic and the dead I saw, I've never seen things like that before. So we just wanted to share what was working, what was not working so they could help our people back home. And here we are three years now still doing this. It's amazing that we still always have about 40 people locked in at every given time, 40 to 50, not talking about those who are watching on Facebook and uh, the other media uh, outlets out there. And we are very open to partnerships, which we have done here before. It's really 
there is it's an organization which is made up of the people and I've told everyone it belongs to every Cameroonian who is in the healthcare field or who is a lover of healthcare. And we're open to partnerships and uh, we're open to getting healthcare, moving healthcare forward in Cameroon. That's the goal. Bringing those in the diaspora closer to those back at home and bringing those back at home closer to those in the diaspora so we can share ideas, learn from each other and move forward. So I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm looking forward to our partnership with the, AC, um, the ACPA, which is a wonderful group I belong to. I became a physician here because I got letters of recommendation from members of that group. Members of that group actually did uh, make calls for me in order for me to get interviews for residency, which I'm also paying back to the younger ones. And I've never forgotten it. It's just that since I came here, I've been moving from one residency to one fellowship. So it's been, it's been difficult to meet with all the, but I'm always a fan. And I talk positively about it to my friends who have never been part of the group. So I want to thank Dr. Forby for making time to come and listen to us. I, you, you, you are one of those people we are proud of. We heard about you when we were kids. We saw you in CNN. I can never forget that episode of CNN. We saw you. So every Cameroonian really knows you, knows your pathway, knows what you've done. And uh, I'm always proud to tell others each time they're talking about pediatric surgery that, oh, you know, this is the Cameroonian who is also a pioneer in this. So, and a lot of people want to listen to me about that. So we're proud of you and we want to emulate you and your example. Now I would want to thank the moderators too. They are not paid moderators. A lot of them are either physicians, that we have some few pharmacies, we have others who are also researchers. They come here every fortnight to give their time and uh, to sacrifice real time to make us uh, discuss some of these topics which are important. Finally, Dr. Anguafo is a friend and a brother and I've always told him about the town hall and he promised he was gonna show up. And uh, did he show up? Yes, he did. And uh, he also made us proud. Epilepsy is something I learn every day and I learned a lot today. And I think a lot of us have learned so much in this uh, discussion. We call it a town hall. This was a whole debate to get the names right. We call it a town hall because we bring in a presenter and at the end we have a discussion. We could have contributions, which Dr. Valentine gave contributions, Dr. Likobo gave, Dr. Dita gave contributions. And we can also have questions, but at the end of the day, we have this and we come with a, with a, with a compromise on how, what to do and how to move things forward. So we're happy that we have had people in this forum who have started research back home, who have come here and have met partners, they have started research. We've had others who have come here to this forum and uh, it has led to big grants that in the future, you know a lot about some of them, but they have led to big grants. The Gate Foundation used to log into this town hall. They made it by chance, but they were logging into this town hall. They were not Cameroonians, but they were logging into this town hall up to the point where they wanted to finance us at the same time. And you get it. So you can imagine how, whom you would attract on LinkedIn, never know. So these are things we have experienced. The Minister of Health at one time had wanted to come to the town hall when COVID was still an issue in Cameroon. And he called off his appointment for some um, uh, time constraint issues. So you can see we started this, but others saw it. Professor Anguafo also, who was then the Secretary General, came here several times and uh, just listened. And uh, we're very amazed that we could have people like that. And uh, we've had others who have been to the town hall. So thank you, everyone. Alison, back to you is just a word of thanks. And just to tell everyone, if you know someone, who has something to offer, who is a friend of yours, whom you want him to come to the town hall and talk to Cameroonians about uh, any healthcare issues, then we are open to having them. There are also non Cameroonians who do come here. There are Ghanaian professors. There is a Gabonese uh, professor who shows here all the time. And they want to emulate this back in their own communities, back uh, in the diaspora and also in, uh, back at home. So thank you.
thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, that vote of thanks. And um, maybe the, a comment that the ACPA, one thing they are getting right is that they have a female president. So if you are a physician out here and you haven't joined the ACPA, you should consider joining them. They are doing an amazing job. And it's just having a, a female president, it shows that they are open. Uh, to innovation and we don't have um, women's voices being stifled among all these powerful and highly educated men. On this note, we officially close today's session of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. There is a parking lot immediately after this. The parking lot is less formal, it's not recorded and it is not streamed on social media. It's just an opportunity for people to network a little more closely and to discuss things that they would otherwise not even feel comfortable to discuss um, on the recorded versions, as well as you know, ask questions that might not have been answered uh, during the uh, recorded and the live sessions. And during this parking lot, we have Fufu Kwan that will be available and Dr. Dita and the man Kong people will be bringing us a chew, there will be palm wine. So please, Join us at the parking lot. And on that note, thank you all and have a beautiful evening.